Hi, Nick. Hi. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Um, so we're streaming straight into the Facebook group already. Um, we'll just give it a couple of minutes to um, for everybody to join and for the broadcast to go out on Facebook. Um, I apologise now for the background noise. I will mute myself once you get started. Um, right. I'm in a cafe and I've also forgotten my headphones. <laughs> so I will mute myself. But um, yeah, let me just double check that it's going out properly. And then we can start and you can introduce yourself. Yeah, I can see it. There's like a 20 second delay on what, they, what gets uh, seen in Facebook, so it's just a little bit slower. Um, how's your day going? Yeah, good. Good for a Tuesday. Sun shining. You can't complain, can you, when the sun's shining? Doesn't it make a difference when the sun shines? Yeah. Everyone's just a little bit more happier. Especially this year. I mean, I feel like we've not seen the sun for about six months. <laughs> oh, no, it's like never-ending winter, isn't it? At one point, I thought I was going to build an ark. Seems like the sensible thing to do because it never stopped raining. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to um give us a little um intro to yourself before you get going? And uh yeah, and then back on. Because yeah. I know that we have got a lot of people that are really interested to hear what you've got to say and what you're gonna show us today. Um because obviously you remember from when your own kids were younger how worrying this time is so anyway I'll let you get on and introduce yourself um and okay. who Daisy are yeah so hi everyone I'm Nick from Daisy First Aid um and basically what we do is teach expecting and new parents families grandparents baby and child first aid so you can have a bit more confidence on what you need to do in case you should ever need it um, I've got two children who are extremely clumsy. So there's another reason why I am a Daisy First Aid trainer as well. Loads of stories, do not have enough time this whole week to get through oh, my story. I almost feel like the children that we get given are the ones that are sent for a purpose. You know, yeah. you got clumsy children and I got a child with allergies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know. First aid has become my purpose and my passion. <laughs> so, yeah. So, what I will say to parents is things do happen. Doesn't mean that you're a bad parent. Just children will get into everything, will find their own path. Doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. So, yeah. So, today I'm going to talk to you about choking, which I would say is probably the number one thing that people always ask us about on our classes. Um, you can see when we get to choking in my classes, people go, oh, OK, then that's what I came here for, because I've uh, they're coming up to weaning and then there's loads of advice and you get a little bit anxious about it or something's happened in the family where someone's choked and then everyone decides they need to learn what to do. So I agree. I think definitely in all my weaning workshops is definitely the number one question all the time. Yeah. And it causes so much anxiety and it's just, you've just got to think it's just one of those things. So two different types of choking. So we've got mild choking and gagging and we've got severe choking. So mild choking and gagging, if they're bright red and making a noise, so going, <coughs> it means they're breathing. Because to be able to make a sound, you've got to be breathing. So we kind of say when they do that, try and let them cough it up themselves, try and work it out themselves. Coughing is the most effective way to get out of partial blockage. So it is a good life skill to teach them. Some children don't instinctively start coughing. You've just got to try and talk them into coughing. Oh, so it's not a natural sort of reflex every single time? Not every single time, because with choking, kids don't understand what it is. So they'll just freeze and just sit they like scared so try and encourage them to cough it up um 
children, little ones, when you start weaning, they will gag. Their gag reflex is further forward than ours. It's kind of like a self-defense mechanism. So it kind of goes further back as you go. So don't worry. It's not because you've done anything wrong. They will naturally gag because it is a learning curve of how much to put in your mouth when they do actually find the mouth. If they're like my kids, it was mashed potato everywhere but the mouth. Um, <laughs> so it is a learning curve of how much to put in your mouth and how much you've got to swallow. So don't worry when they're just finding that out. I think it's... Um... It's sometimes difficult for us to remember well, because we can't remember what it was like at a point when we yeah. couldn't eat. We forget that it's a skill that actually you have to learn. And there's so many different muscles going on in the mouth and in the throat that all need to be trained and strengthened in order to allow us to be efficient when we're, we're eating, I guess. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So don't worry. It, it is a bit of like, why is this going everywhere and why they're not putting it in the mouth? So don't worry, we've all been through it. It's not your child's weird. That's just what they do. Um, so that's mild choking and gagging. Okay, should be okay, work it out. Severe choking, the choking that kills people is completely silent. And that is the biggest misconception people have about choking. They think it's going to be coughing, spluttering, waving arms, stamping feet. It's not, it's completely silent. So that's when you need to step in. So when I say completely silent, they might be going like that, but not making a sound. Again, they might just sit there because they're scared and they don't understand what's going on and just look at you with a frightened look in the face and lips might start going blue. So, yeah, so that's the virtual. I, um, I could, uh, throughout, throughout my sort of career, when I've been talking to parents, I always used to explain that because I've learned really well from Daisy. and. Um, it wasn't until my child my daughter was about three and we actually had a choking incident that I could totally understand what the silent how silent it was I mean it is silent like like deafeningly silent and like you say they don't they they don't know what to do she was she was literally just in shock it was all good because I did everything I was supposed to do and actually she she just went oh that got stuck and then carried on <laughs> I was like Oh my God, but that silence is something that I don't think you can underestimate. It's just really silent. Yeah, and I think people think, well, what do you mean silent? It's like, no, a bit like you've described there, you will know the difference if it does happen to you. I mean, a big tip I give you is a parent, not just a daisy, is always supervise your children when they're eating. Because it just takes that 30 seconds to a minute and you think, oh, they're in the high chair, strapped in, got the tray on, got the carrot sticks or whatever. Oh, I'll just load the dishwasher because I've still got all the tea dishes from last night. It's so or, tempting, isn't it? Yeah. Or you think, oh, I've had a punami. I'll just fill the washing machine up and get that. Smell out of yeah. And then they can be choking because it's silent. You will not know. No, it's and yeah, and it happens so quickly. So yeah, watch, you know, and I as well, I always use the term watchful waiting when um, parents are worried about introducing solids to their child, because actually, there's no point avoiding foods. I mean, you can prepare them in different ways, obviously, but you're much better waiting and watching um, for anything and being able to step in if necessary um, and being ready. And obviously, that's what you guys at Daisy enable parents to do, to be ready in case something happens. Yeah, yeah. So I've got my little Daisy baby. So I just thought I'd talk you through. I know it's a bit scary sometimes, especially expecting parents when they say this and they're like, I'm like, your baby will not look like this. It'll be super cute. <laughs> I did a class of 13 expecting parents last night and they were like, Oh my God. And I'm like, <laughs> your baby will be lovely and squidgy and gorgeous. Your baby will be beautiful. <laughs> they will be beautiful. They will not be like my little chicken fillet leg baby <laughs> here. So, but to be a choker, that's when you need to step in. Okay. So, this is for under ones. It does change slightly when they go over ones, but I'm just going to do under ones because obviously weaning in with six months and stuff like that. So what we're going to do first is a back blow, which is just a fancy first aid term for a big whack on the back. OK, so where you're going to do it is up here in between the shoulder blades. So up here. OK, now 
don't worry about how hard you hit in. There's no internal organs up here. They're at the bottom and at the front. So the worst you can do is a bit of bruising. People always worry about, oh, am I going to hit them too hard? The thing with choking, time is not on your side. The sooner you can get it out, the better it's going to be. Okay. So you probably will hit them harder than you think because you're going to have adrenaline pumping through you. Don't worry about that. The thing with kids is they completely bounce back dead easily. So they might cry for five minutes and then they'll be like, uh, where's the banana for me pudding? Yeah, I, and I can vouch for that. They're just like, oh, that, that moment has passed. I've moved on from that now. Yeah, and you're busy rocking yourself backwards and forwards going, we're never having broccoli in this house again. <laughs> it's parents. So what you're going to do, lift them up, arm for the legs, support the head, and you're going to put them over your legs. So pretend I'm putting this little baby on my knees. I'm just lifting them up so you can see. And then what we're going to do with the heel of your hand, we're going to give a big hard black blow in between the shoulder blades. So you can either go straight down or, depending on how long your arms are, you can go across like that. But make sure you land there, don't skim it because you're going to hit the back of their head and they're not going to thank you for that either. So we're going to do a big back bow, like that. That's when people go, oh, 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 just this. In that situation, you will be. So Yeah, I mean, you'd rather bow. do that than the, than the alternative, I guess. Yeah. It's yeah. the lesser of two evils. Exactly. You're going down a road that you don't want to go down. So just mm. get it out. Don't worry about it. So we're going to do one. We're going to do a quick check. Because if you've got little weirdo children like mine who love the food, but shove it in, even at nine and five, they still do that. Um, sometimes they bring it up and catch it in the gums of the teeth. My Sophie did that when she was little. And I'm like, spit it out. You're like going out of your mind. So I'm going to do one, check to see if they've caught it. If they're still conscious and still stuck, you're going to go again with another one. So you're going to give five in total, but just keep checking in between each one. So, do your five back blows. So in between the shoulder blades, I'm gonna push down. If that doesn't work and they're still conscious, what we're gonna do is turn them over and do chest fuss, okay? So they're like baby abdominal fuss. So where we're gonna do it, that's the two nipples there, you can see. That triangle there is the bottom of your rib cage. So we're doing it in between those two. So for under ones, over ones you do, Loads of people have seen where you pull in on the squidgy bit of your tummy. Under ones, you've got to do it on the rib cage because their internal organs are closer together. So we do it a lot differently. So two fingers, I'd have them on my knee to take the weight, but you're going to do a short, sharp press down to basically force the rib cage down to push the air out the lungs to push it up and out. Bizarre technique, but it does work. You think it won't, but it does. And again, we're going to give five of those, but checking in between each one. Okay. What I'd say is if you hear gurgling, that's it coming out. So if they're on the back like this, I'd probably tip them forward or like tip them up to help get it out. Because it's a bit hard to be sick on your back like that. Now, if that still doesn't work, you go back to your back blows. So you're going to go around in a circle, five back blows, five chest thrusts until either it comes out. And you're like, hallelujah, that's the best vomit I've had on me in my entire life. And I can say that because I'm a Geordie. So. <laughs> yes, it, it yeah. is a relief when it comes out as well. <laughs> it is a relief, that's really good. And you will tell because they'll start crying straight away. Red, the colour will come back into the cheeks and everything like that. If it doesn't come out and they go unconscious, that's when you'd have to put them on the floor and start your CPR, which we teach you in our classes. Um, it is different from adult CPR. So if you've done first aid of work and stuff like that, it is different how you do it on a baby than an adult, because obviously there's a big size difference. And I, I think this is really important to stress as well, because quite often I'll say to people about paediatric first aid and they're like, oh, I've done a work first aid course. And it's like, no, it's completely different, um, completely different. Yeah, yeah. Because if you think the size of me and you compared to a baby, you definitely wouldn't do a two pounds, which is what most people have seen, because you're going to cause some damage. So, yeah, there is, there is a big difference with how to do it. Um, lots of people always ask us, when's the right time to ring an ambulance? 
there's no right or wrong when you ring 999. Some people say to me, I'm a panicker. I just need to ring straight away so I can calm down and do what I need to do. That's absolutely fine. Put your phone on loudspeaker in down line 99. So you've got both hands free so you can crack on with this as fast as possible. We kind of say, if you haven't rang 999, by the time you start your chest rows, so you've done your five back rows, start ringing then. Because you're better off having someone on the way than waiting until the unconscious and you're doing CPR. Also, it might be trapped in such a way that they don't go unconscious. They've just got enough air going up and down to keep them conscious, but you can't get them out, get whatever it is out. Well, you're not going to put them in the car seat in the back of the car like that. You're going to have to go in an ambulance. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And how long are you going to keep doing this and doing this on a little one? Yeah. So please don't be embarrassed and do the British thing of, I'm sure there's someone worse off than me. No, get someone on the way. Every paramedic, every consult, paediatric consultant will say that you would rather you come in sooner than come in later. So don't worry, there'll be no one. If it comes out while you're on the phone to 999, the 999 operator will be just as relieved as you are that it's come out. There'll be no one knocking on your front door the next day going, did you ring an ambulance when you weren't supposed to? That does not happen. <laughs> the more you ring and get some help on the way. Yeah, and and the thing is as well because we've all got loudspeakers on our mobiles now as well. You know, yeah. we can crack on with that whilst we're still doing the actions that are potentially going to save a life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so when you come sort of to solid food and things like that, if you think round food is just not your friend when it comes to choking hazards, so. Everyone knows kind of like grapes are one of the biggest sort of culprits of choking. Um, make sure you cut them at lengthways at the quarters because if you cut something lengthways, it's got a long straight edge. So if it gets caught, there's still a gap around the side to let air up and down. Um, mini eggs as well. Um, lots of people don't realise mini eggs are a choking hazard because they're the same shape as a grape. And kids just love them and they're like bah, 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 bah. yeah but I've seen them they get stuck and because of that hard outer shell it doesn't melt so like if it was a chocolate button or mm. a bit i don't know cabbage dairy milk or whatever you're given it would be melting with your internal body heat either come out or go down with mini eggs it'll just sit there and, actually, and that's the thing, isn't it? That hard outside like similar with a grape and a cherry tomato it's it's yeah. not going to crush it's not going to soften it's it's going to stay whole exactly yeah yeah and on the back of mini egg packets a teeny tiny writing it's got caution chalk and hazard do not give to under fours is that quite a new like, I don't until I sort of or maybe I just didn't notice until I had children <laughs> I just never even I thought about it and it's probably that to be honest yeah yeah loads of people don't realize so if Daisy we just say you just eat them yourself to save like your children from eating them <laughs> That sounds like a wonderful solution to me. <laughs> Happy all round. You I am, I'm saving, I'm saving you from potential danger by eating your chocolate. Yeah, yeah. I had that one for years, but now mine two are nine and five, so I haven't got that excuse, unfortunately. But yeah, and like you say, like cherry tomatoes, blueberries, I have a crush them or cut them lengthways. Um, yeah, we do get a lot of people, particularly grandmas and grandes kind of old school first aid and I can completely understand that to say oh if I could see it can I just put my finger in and scoop it out I can kind of understand the logic problem with that is you can push it further down and if it's something scratchy if you scratch your airways it swells up so it's going to be a lot more trickier to get out the safest thing to do is go straight to your back rows. don't worry you're not going to cause any damage or anything like that so if you get it out and afterwards, they develop a persistent cough or when they're swallowing, you can see that it's hurting them. So they're like, that indicates that they've damaged their airway somewhere. So you need to go get that checked out. Likewise, we kind of say just as an extra, extra precaution, if you give the chest busts, just get them checked out for any internal damage. Unlikely, but we'll just say that as an extra precaution. Is that an emergency or is that a case of call your doctor and see what they say? Yeah. It's not an emergency because it's come yeah. out and you're kind of okay. So I'd ring your GP or 111. Yeah. Okay. Because a lot of places have like walk-in centres. 
where they can go get them checked out rather than sit for hours and hours in A&E. &E. Are there any other foods that we have to be careful of um, when it comes to choking other than just the round stuff? Um, I'm thinking, yeah. yeah, go. Sausages as well, mainly because of the skin, but if that's a sausage, people cut them into circles to try and cut them lengthways. Popcorn's in there as well, because it's dry and scratchy. So that can get caught. Um, and does the popcorn get stuck or is it just? It can get stuck, but it can scratch it as well. So it's not going to help. Um, it's a bit like crusty bread, really. Sometimes it can get stuck and then be really painful. Um, also those really round, hard lollies, cheap lollies that come off the stick without you. Yeah, we, I mean, they should be banned in my opinion. I just hate yeah. them, but they, they come home in every party bag and every everywhere all the time, but they, especially because if they're sucking them, I guess, and it pulls off the, off the stick. I mean, this will be when your child's older because I wouldn't advocate giving them you know, yeah. at the start of weaning, but it is something to think about. And um, yeah, um, somebody said to me as well about marshmallows being a, a choke risk. Yeah. Which I'd never yeah. really thought of before. Yeah, I think when you think about it, yeah, marshmallows would be because they're so squidgy, it'll just sit there, won't it? And because it kind of not expands, but it'll just sit there. And I think it's a bit like melted cheese. If you have like a melted marshmallow and you're trying to get it out, it's just keeps going yeah. and keeps going and keeps going. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then um what about peanut butter? I guess. Do we need to use that quite sparingly so it doesn't sort of stick stick together in their throat if there's quite a lot of it? Yeah, yeah. So claggy, that's probably a very northern word. Claggy no, I use I use the word claggy all the time when I'm describing um chicken breast actually, <laughs> particularly like how chicken breast goes quite dry as well. Um so no, yeah. it's not a northern thing because I'm definitely not northern. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. What I will say is we can sort of highlight common foods that are choking, but you will find kids if they shove it all the way down, it could be anything. I've heard stories of mashed potato, mushy peas, yeah. um, generally that sort of thing, a couple of back bores. Yeah, and I, it comes back to that thing about watchful waiting, doesn't it, rather than avoidance, um, preparing the food in the right way, and then making sure that you stay with them so that if it happens, you can act um yeah. and and as well i guess the cases of real severe choking with a really terrible outcome are, are relatively rare um yeah yeah but it's good to, i think it helps your anxiety as well if you know what to do because then you're prepared but what i'd say is try and keep calm in that situation because if your little one sees you panic and crying, yeah. they're going to panic yeah. so they're going to be breathing faster and that's not going to help them yeah. at all. So just try and, and I, keep calm until you get yeah, it Yeah, keep calm. But I think partly if you've, if you've gone and done a paediatric um, first aid course, then you know what to do and then it kicks in when you need it. Definitely. It's not necessarily always at the front of your mind, but when you need it, yeah. it should come forward and then you should be able to use it, which is exactly what happened with me. You know, I would have said that I, I couldn't really remember and yet I just went into, okay, focus mode. Um, yeah. And my husband was slightly different. He, because I think he did do a workshop with us, but I don't think he probably wasn't paying attention. I was going to say, was he listening? <laughs> because he was the panicker. And he ended up like literally in a puddle on the floor, whereas I knew it and I just knew I had to do the job basically. So yeah, yeah knowledge is definitely power when it comes to stuff like this. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about where we can get hold of you and where Daisy is and how people can get hold of you for workshops and stuff? Because I know there's a lot of you now, isn't there? There's a lot there of friends. There is a lot of friends. There is a lot of friends. In a good way, though. Yeah, um, yeah, good, yeah. So we're all over the UK, all the way up to Scotland, down to London, Cornwall, Wales. I'm in Leeds and Yorkshire um, and Harrogate and everywhere in between. So... If you want to find the local Daisy to you, if you just go to our website at www.daisyfirstaid.com, 
there's a find a class click on that put your postcode in it'll bring up the closest person to you and we do either private home classes where families and friends get together get the tea and biscuits out we come and do the class and bring everything we need then you get the whiskey out when we go no i'm only joking um Oh, you could, we do venue classes and we we'll also do uh, live online Zoom classes, so a bit like this. So if you want to sit in your pyjamas on a Saturday morning and do the class with me, you're more than welcome. I Don't love an online you. class in my pyjamas. <laughs> yeah, I think I've spent the first 12 weeks when my eldest was born just in pyjamas. So there's definitely no judgment. There's no book. shame in some excessive pyjama wearing when you are with children. Oh yeah, absolutely. I used to, when we took a kid along, and there used to be days where I'd be like, we just spent all day in my pyjamas. And I used to think I'd failed as a mother because we hadn't, they hadn't brushed the teeth, but like we hadn't actually got dressed and left the house. But now they're old, I'm like, what do you want to do? They're like, do you have a pyjama day? They were the best days. And I'm like, wow, those were the days I felt like I failed. <laughs> but they're actually one of their best memories. So yeah, you know, brilliant. Go good yourself, <laughs> just enjoy the ride. Brilliant. Um, thanks so much, Nick. That was really helpful. Um, we are seeing you again tomorrow Thursday. or th oh, Thursday? Thursday, same time. Yeah. Talking about allergies and allergic yeah. reactions. Which will um, be the perfect follow on from our workshop in the morning, which is with our um, doctor, Dr. Helen Gruff um, from the Evelina in London and the children's allergy doctors um, and she's going to be talking all about the allergies and then we'll talk to you about what to do should it happen so it's yeah, perfect definitely. much made in yeah. heaven yeah so we will see you then but thank you so much and uh, have a good rest of the day in the sunshine you too i will <laughs> see you later you, everyone bye